All right, welcome back. We are now in topic 11, which covers gases. And if you recall, back in topic 8, we talked about solids and liquids. And we actually chunked those two states of matter together because solids and liquids actually share a lot of the same uh, properties because they both experience intermolecular forces. However, gases do not experience intermolecular forces, and therefore they exhibit very different properties. And so we actually talk about them separately from solids and liquids, and they get their own chapter. So gases is going to be topic 11, which corresponds to chapter 8 in the textbook. Before we get started looking at gases in a quantitative sense, meaning calculations and numbers, we're going to first start off in section 1, which talks about properties of gases in a qualitative sense. So we're going to look at the behavior of gases and some of those qualitative aspects for how they behave. All right, to get started, we're going to first talk about some definitions here. Um, first thing you need to be familiar with is the difference between gas and vapor. So we reserve the term vapor for referring to the gas state of something that would normally be solid or liquid at room temperature. Okay, and so for example, um, H2O. If we were to be talking about H2O, what is the state of matter under normal conditions for, for H2O? It would be liquid, right? Liquid is the normal state of matter that water comes in. And so when water turns into the gas phase, we wouldn't say it's water gas. We would say it's water vapor. However, for uh, another example is oxygen. What state of matter does, is oxygen under normal room conditions? Um, oxygen is a gas. And so we wouldn't say it's oxygen vapor. We would actually just simply say it's oxygen gas. So that's the difference between the two terms vapor and gas. Now, in terms of looking at the periodic table and looking at what elements come in the gas form under normal standard conditions, very few elements actually exist as gases. So if you think about all the elements on the periodic table, uh, five of the seven diatomics, so hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine, as well as obviously the noble gases, are the only elements that are gas at standard conditions. Every other element is either a solid or a liquid. In terms of compounds, we find that molecular compounds, which remember molecular is the, uh, the same thing as covalent. So we find that covalent or molecular compounds with relatively low molar masses tend to favor the gas state. So for example, carbon dioxide or hydrogen chloride would be examples of molecular compounds that would tend to favor the gas phase. Um, a lot of the stuff on this slide should hopefully be uh, a review from you from a previous chemistry course. But remember, I said gases are very different than solids and liquids, and here's a list of how, that, how that's true. First of all, gases are going to expand and take the shape of their container, regardless of what shape the container is. So even if it was a weird like conglomeration of tubes, as long as it, there's open passage, the gas will fill the container equally. Um, and so that means that there's no definite shape or volume for gases. They're going to fill up whatever container that they're in. Because of that, and especially because of, look at all this empty space that exists between gas particles, gases are compressible. So because gas particles may fill up a large space, we actually can compress them into a smaller space, where if you look with solids and liquids, there's not, there's not any room to compress any further. And so gases are compressible, and that's actually really important. Um, that actually was one of the key uh, attributes that drove the Industrial Revolution and a lot of the advancements we made. Um, gases also have much, much lower densities. And the reason why is this. Remember, what, what's the equation for density? How do you calculate density? Density is found by taking mass over volume. Well, think about if you had a container of gas particles, okay, and I'm making the gas particles very small because relative to the size of the container, the gas particles themselves are super tiny. So if you think about the mass of this container, which would probably be really tiny because gases don't weigh a lot, divided by the volume of this container, which relatively speaking is a really large space, you can see that when you take something really small and divide it by a very large quantity, that's going to result in a very low density. So not only are gases very have very low densities, but they are highly variable depending on temperature and pressure. You're going to see in this unit that when we look at gases, specifically in a chemical reaction, you're always going to see that the, the temperature and the pressure has to be stated. And the reason for that is because gases and their behavior are going to vary quite significantly depending on what the temperature and what the pressure is. 
when it comes to solids and liquids, solids and liquids don't vary a lot with temperature and pressure, provided that the temperature and pressure changes aren't extreme. And so we don't typically include that, but with gases we will. And finally, gases are always going to form homogeneous mixtures. So for example, if this represented a, a room, okay, and you filled gases in here, let's say you filled oxygen gas and nitrogen gas, and let's say some argon and some carbon dioxide, I'm just throwing different gases in there. These gases aren't gonna stay isolated in their corners. Instead, they're going to mix homogeneously or evenly, uniformly, throughout the entire room. And that's true for any container that they're in. All right, some other properties that you need to be aware of. Um, first of all, as molecular weight or molecular mass increases, the speed is gonna decrease. And this should be intuitive, because if you have a really big gas particle, really heavy, and you had a really tiny gas particle, the heavy particle, because it has more mass, is not gonna be able to move as fast as, let's say, this really tiny particle. It's kind of like saying, okay, if you took an, you know, Olymp a really lean Olympic triathlete and then a sumo wrestler and had them race, um, I'm going to guess, I'm just going to guess that the Olympic athlete's probably going to be able to move faster simply because of less mass. And it's the same for looking at um, molecules of gases. So the heavier the, the gas particle itself or the higher the molar mass, if you will, the slower it's going to move at a given um, set of conditions. And then finally, there's two terms I need you to be familiar with. There's diffusion and effusion. And I've got some pictures down here to illustrate what the difference is because they kind of sound the same. So gas diffusion is simply mixing of gases. So you can see here, if there was a gas one and gas two and we allowed there to be an opening, those two gas particles would actually mix together. That's, the, that's known as diffusion. So you would say the gases are diffusing versus effusion is where you have a gas and then there's a region of uh, empty space meaning there's nothing there's no matter that's known as a vacuum so if there is a tiny opening and gases are allowed to escape we would say the gas is effusing so they sound similar um, but there are key differences there all right to wrap up the uh, section one which talks about those properties of gases we get to the kinetic molecular theory which oftentimes we'll abbreviate is KMT now that sounds really scientific, really fancy. What does KMT or kinetic molecular theory stand for? Well, let's break that down. When you hear kinetic, okay, I want you to think of movement. Anytime you hear kinetic, this is where we get like kinesiology. Anything with that prefix kin refers to movement. And then obviously molecular comes from the word molecule. So really we're looking at the theory of how molecules move. We're looking at some postulates or basic assumptions of how molecules move, particularly gases. And so there are four postulates that I need you to know. The first one is gases are tiny particles with large amounts of space in between. And therefore, the volume of the actual gas particle itself is considered negligible. So let me break that down real quick. So drawing a picture of what I drew on a previous slide, let's say this is a container and these dots that I'm drawing represent gas particles. What this first postulate is saying is, look, the actual volume of this individual particle right here, this tiny particle, the volume of that individual particle is so small relative to the size of the entire container and all that empty space that is in between that we can assume the gas particle volume itself is negligible, okay? We're more concerned with the volume of space it takes up rather than the volume of the gas particle itself. The second postulate is that gases are gonna move in constant, random, straight line motion. And you need to make sure that you, you remember all three of those. Constant, so it's never stopping. Random, you don't know where it's gonna go next. And straight line motion. So that's demonstrated down here in this picture. The gas particles are always gonna move in that constant, random, straight line motion until they hit either another particle in which they would collide and bounce off, or they hit the sides of the container and bounce off. So they're always gonna move in that constant motion. Also with this postulate, all collisions that these gas particles make are perfectly elastic. Um, if you've never taken physics before, you may not be familiar with this term, perfectly elastic. Essentially what that means is when the two particles collide or when a particle collides with the side of the container, it doesn't lose any energy. And so therefore it's able to continue 
with its same energy or its same speed. The third postulate is no attractive or repulsive forces on one another. Essentially, gases are egotistical. They're narcissistic. They think that each particle thinks it's the only particle in that container, and therefore, it's not going to feel attracted or repulsed by any other particles. The only time two particles are really going to have an effect on one another is if they actually collide. And then finally, the average kinetic energy is proportional to the absolute temperature. Now that sounds really fancy and that sounds really scientific, but actually this is probably something you already know, you just didn't know that you knew it. So let me ask you a question. If you were to go outside in summertime, okay, think of July or August in Arizona, okay, it feels really hot. Would the gas particles be in the air, the atmosphere, would they be moving fast or slow? And the answer is fast. Most students know that when particles are hot or they feel hot, they're moving very fast. Well, what causes particles to move at all? It's kinetic energy. And the more they're moving, the faster they're moving, the more kinetic energy. So you can think fast moving particles equals high kinetic energy. Okay, And so the average kinetic energy is proportional to the absolute temperature. In other words, when the kinetic energy increases, temperature increases. They're proportional to one another. And that makes sense. If the kinetic energy is increasing, that means the particles are moving faster, which means the temperature must be higher. But notice it's very specific about what temperature scale that it's talking about the absolute temperature scale, which if you remember from topic one, absolute temperature scale is Kelvin. Okay, so Kelvin, which just has the abbreviation K. Notice it's not degrees K, it's just K. And so you'll notice in this unit with gases, every time that we calculate using temperature, the temperature needs to be in Kelvin. Um, I'll remind you of this probably in some later videos, but for right now, to get from Celsius to Kelvin, in order, in other words, to calculate Kelvin, you just take the degrees Celsius and you're going to add to it the value of 273.15. Make sure you know it's 0.15. I know in previous chemistry courses, they may have just said 273, but we want to be a little bit more accurate. So we're going to do 273.15. All right. Well, that concludes section one. We'll see you in section two.